worship a creature is the essence of idolatry, no matter how exalted that creature may be. And one of the reasons why the New Testament, such as the book of Colossians and the book of Hebrews, labors so hard to counteract the idea that Jesus was like a supreme angel. And the point that they're making is that his being is above that of angelic beings. Indeed, shares in the deity with the Father and the Son. Now, the second affirmation we'll look at today is affirmation number seven. We affirm that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, the virgin-born descendant of David, comma, he had a true human nature, was subject to the law of God, and was like us at all points except without sin. We affirm that faith in the true humanity of Christ is essential to faith in the gospel. We deny that anyone who rejects the humanity of Christ, his incarnation, or his sinlessness, or who maintains that these truths are not essential to the gospel, will be saved. That is, integral to the biblical gospel is not only the clear affirmation of the deity of Christ, but also a clear affirmation of the humanity of Christ. If we jump to the 5th century, after the 4th century Council of Nicaea, and go to the Council of Chalcedon, we remember that it is there that the Church confessed that Christ was vera homo, vera deus truly man and truly God, having two natures distinct from each other, a human nature and a divine nature. And just as it is of vital importance to affirm the divine nature of Christ, as the church was careful to proclaim in the fourth century, so it is also of vital importance to proclaim the humanity of Christ, because it is in his humanity that Christ becomes the new Adam, who becomes our human representative by submitting himself to the law and living his life of perfect righteousness and offering himself as a sacrifice on the cross as an atonement for our sins. So that crucial to his redemptive work is his achieving in his humanity a life of perfect sinlessness for him to qualify as our Savior. Jesus himself had to be without sin. Jesus himself had to live a life of perfect obedience because if he sinned, he couldn't qualify to give an atonement for himself, let alone for us and for our sins, so that the idea of his human sinlessness is tied to the whole biblical concept of our redemption. Now, it is affirmed here that Jesus is God incarnate, again referring to John chapter 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is Emmanuel. God with us. He is the virgin-born descendant of David. Again, an allusion to the biblical proclamation that the way in which Christ came into the world was miraculous through his conception in the womb of a virgin, but that he was, in terms of his human nature, of the genealogy of David as the New Testament calls attention to the significance of Jesus being David's son, yet at the same time, David's Lord. We remember Psalm 110, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. And this one who came out of the root and lineage of David was at the same time David's Lord. It's called David's greater son. 
in biblical categories. And that he was a descendant of David was also seen in the New Testament as being crucial to the claims for Christ fulfilling the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament because the Messiah was to be, among other things, the fulfillment of the king, like unto David, who would have to be from the tribe of Judah. The kingdom had been promised to the tribe of Judah as early as the patriarchal blessing that Jacob gave to his sons. 